Good evening, everyone. This is the uh, meeting of the Committee on Fiscal Affairs. Uh, we have an agenda, which uh, many of you have. Uh, first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of September 9, 2015. Move them. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> the second uh, uh, items for us are on our policy calendar. Uh, item number one is the approval of a uh, revised schedule of tuition charges for the Doctor of Medicine, Medical Education at the City College of New York. Uh, <clears throat> this is um, a proposed tuition at the CUNY School of Medicine of $38,000 per year for full-time resident status and $63,260 per year full-time non-resident status. The tuition rate is the same as the rate charged by the State University of New York SUNY Downstate for its medical school. Uh, the entire tuition will be retained by the CUNY School of Medicine to fund direct costs of the degree program and the student activity fee schedule, which you also have, is the same rate as that charged other graduate students at City College and will be retained by the CUNY School of Medicine to benefit its students. Uh, I believe the provost is here to respond to any questions of the, uh, of the committee. Um, and the one question that, that I had was just a, a brief explanation for us of the process that you went through to determine that the appropriate tuition was to match SUNY Downstate. Yes. Um so uh, the, well, the challenge that we were facing is trying to establish the medical school with uh, appropriate funding and uh, without impacting the, uh, the funding of the city college. And uh, we thought that philosophically and uh, programmatically would be the be would be good to match the tuition of the medical school to the other state. There are four there are four SUNY medical schools. Downstate, uh, SUNY Buffalo, Syracuse, and Stony Brook. And they all charge the same. The states charge exactly the same amount of tuition. So we felt that this would be appropriate for us, being a state school, to be packed to, to, to their tuition. And will allow us to uh, generate the appropriate resources that we need in order to support the accreditation. Any other questions or comments? I, I, I've, I've got to know what the dollar forty-five Senate fee is for. I'm sorry. I couldn't. The dollar forty-five Senate fee. Yeah. I'm. I don't know. Except that it's a similar fee for other students at City College. Yeah, the activity University fees students are. Students are University students. University students. That's all they get. Yes. A buck forty-five. <laughs> I thought you were concerned that it went to the faculty. You didn't know. I yeah. I want to find out how, what my cut was. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you have an in-state and an out-of-state tuition, and one of the goals of the medical school is to provide doctors for inner city, et cetera. Do we have any plans to limit out-of-state attendees versus in-state? We were told it would be illegal to discriminate against out-of-state students. Okay. And Chair Schwartz, if I can, I just want to, I want to clarify two things. One is um, Provost Trevisan was talking about the tuition rate earlier. Um, and we did set it to the to the SUNY rate, but um, the tuition is not going to be sufficient to cover our expected costs of the medical school. And later on in the uh, fiscal committee meeting, when we go through the budget request, you'll see that we are requesting funds for the medical school to help cover all of the costs um, for for the new school. The second thing I'd like to clarify is. Um, and speaking with Provost Trevisan, and I know he, he, um, he coordinated with, with President Koiko, um, the college has decided at this time they are not going to put forth the excellence fee of $500 per semester that's part of this resolution. Um, and so that is not something that um, we're putting for your approval this evening. Yeah, I have to say that historically, in the last 43 years, we never had another state student. Oh, okay. Thank you. How many students do you contemplate uh, opening? 70. 70. 70 students. It's roughly class. the numbers that we have these days. In each class? In each class. In each class of the four years of the medical school. It's a BSMD program, so it's a seven-year program that we recruit the students from high school. For the first three years, they do the 
undergraduate portion, they, and they, they, they end with, up with the Bachelor of Science, and then they move into the fourth year, and then they do the medical school. During the medical school, we, we, we are counting on 70 years per student. Any other questions or comments? I neglected to uh, move the approval of action item number one. I'll now move it and ask for a second. 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 <clears throat> and I'll ask again, any other questions or comments? Uh, if not, all in favor? No. Yes, I, Una. My question is, um, do you have a plan as to where um, they would intern as, uh, as young and new physicians? Um, is there a sense of you know where they'd get yes. their greatest we have, experience. We have, a, we have a very strong affiliation with St. Barbara's, St. Barbara's Healthcare Center in the Bronx. The main part is the hospital, but they have a lot of clinical facilities as well. We are in the process of finalizing an affiliation agreement with HHC, the Health and Hospital Corporation with the Public Hospital in New York. And we have already established a series of uh, affiliation with the community health center throughout, throughout the uh, Manhattan and the Bronx. <laughs> then could I make a recommendation mm -hmm. that you consider Brookdale Hospital in Brooklyn that serves a real underserved community in Brownsville, East New York. Um, and I think that HHC could embrace that. Um, and I think that for the most part, the elected officials from that area would very much want to participate and to invest in it if they are going to be getting the benefits. I would be very happy to do it. Mr. Chairman, could we have further discussion so that I get a sense of how that would happen? Since St. Barnabas is in the Bronx and Brookdale is in South Central Brooklyn, is there a way in which Further discussion at a subsequent meeting? Yeah. Of course. Fine. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Are we ready to vote on the approval? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It carries with one abstent with two abstentions. Yeah. <coughs> Item number two is a resolution requesting that the Board of Trustees authorize the General Counsel to execute a contract on behalf of the Office of the University Controller with a vendor who will provide services to migrate CUNY's current hosting operations to a new environment and to provide these hosting operations on an ongoing basis in a manner that will meet uh, current and future needs. The hosting services estimated cost will be $6,100,000 per year for five years for a total maximum value of $38,400,000, which also includes $6,400,000 for the migration services required in the first year and an additional $1,500,000 contingency fee for the five-year contract term. The contract will include up to five additional one-year options for the university to renew in its best interest. I move the approval of action item number two. Are there questions and comments uh, from the committee? Uh, hearing none, is there a second? Second. And we'll take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? carries unanimously. Item number three is a resolution requesting the Board of Trustees to authorize the General Counsel to execute a contract for the School of Professional Studies to purchase graduate science seminars from the American Museum of Natural History without competitive solicitation and pursuant to law and university regulations for a term of five years from January 1, 2015 through December 31, 2020. Such purchase shall not exceed a total estimated cost of $1,935,000. The School of Professional Studies will use the science seminars to offer 13 online graduate courses in life science, earth science, and physical science, and expand educational opportunities for science teachers and access to science content for students. I move the approval of action item number three. Is there a second? Second. I have a question. Yes. How many students do we expect to take part in these 13 courses? We have our uh, dean for, uh, at uh, associate dean, I should say, at School of Professional Studies, Brian Peterson. I'm going to, with the chairs, okay, ask Brian to join us. Hi. 
Right. So we expect in a given year about 350 to 400 students from across the university to be engaged in these courses. Most of them coming from Brooklyn College, Lehman College, and from the other senior colleges who have masters in education through the permit system. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And I just want to add from the university's perspective, um, we are really um, pleased to see the School of Professional Studies um, with this proposal because it hits on a couple of sweet spots that, that we're looking for. One is their diversifying graduate offerings, um, which is something that's important. Two, the online aspect of these courses is something that is that we've been um, stressing to do more of. And three, the, the partnership with an institution like the American Museum of Natural History um, we think is a real positive for our, for our students as well. Any other questions or comments from the committee? <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Carries unanimously. Uh, item four is a uh, <clears throat> resolution requesting the board authorize the general counsel to execute a contract on behalf of the Office of the University Controller for the vendor who will provide, as needed, hazardous waste removal services from the central office uh, and uh, the colleges. Uh, the purchase shall not exceed an estimated cost of $2 million, and the contract term shall be for five years. The services are essential for the day-to-day -day operations of the college campuses. In order for them to be in compliance with required federal, state, and local regulations with regards to the removal of hazardous waste. I move the approval of action item number four. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, I am advised before any other committee member asks questions or comments that we are currently in compliance as we sit here today. So it's not as if we're taking action to get into compliance. This is forward looking for the next five years. Are there other questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Carries unanimously. And finally, uh, to my mind, the heart of the matter, which is uh, on the policy calendar, which is the consideration of the fiscal year 16-17 operating budget request. And we'll hear from uh, Vice Chancellor Matthew Sepien. And I move the approval of action item number five on the policy calendar. With a second. Thank you. Second. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Chair Schwartz. And again, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> Um, before you is a, um, a document, um, a PowerPoint presentation on the operating budget request. The actual request document is also part of your packets um, that contains narrative and, and more description about the items that we are asking the state and city to invest in and the mandatory cost increases that are part of our request. But, um, for today, we're going to go through the PowerPoint presentation, which is also up on the screen before you. Um, so the first slide there, the current uh, economic environment, we want to give you a sense of where the state and city are in their, in their current financial planning. And so um, we'll start with the state first. And we have four fiscal years there. Um, the current year, 2016, the state has a balanced financial plan. And over the next three years, the state is projecting surpluses in their financial plan. Um, and this is just a, a, a tremendous improvement um, on the state level from where we were post-recession, uh, fall 2008, when the state had budget deficits of $16 billion. The fact that the state is now projecting surpluses for the next three fiscal years going out um, is, is a real positive thing. Um, on the city of New York side, the city also has a balanced financial plan for the current year. Um, the city is projecting deficits in the out years, um, starting with about $1.6 billion in 2017 and growing to about $2.9 billion in 2019. But again, given the city's overall, the size of the overall city's budget, um, the, these are gaps that, that should be manageable. So again, um, from the state and city perspective, um, we are um, well positioned to, in terms of moving forward over the next three fiscal years. Okay, next slide. Um, I think as a lot of you know, um, this year um, is the last year of the predictable tuition policy. So just to go back and give a little history, 
In 2011, the state authorized a predictable tuition policy for both SUNY and CUNY. And this policy called for um, SUNY and CUNY to have the ability to raise tuition by $300 a year, up to $300 a year for five years. The fifth year of those increases just took place this past fall, um, fall 2015. And so the law expires on July 1st, 2016. Um, so there's no further authorization from the state um, for tuition increases going forward. Um, and we wanted to give you a little history of what had occurred from, from the last um, several years. And so over the time um, since the tuition increases started, we have made programmatic investments of $214 million. And when I say programmatic investments, these were new funds that were added for investments at our campuses. The, none of the $214 million went to plug a budget shortfall. All that $214 million were for new things at our campuses. $134 million at the senior colleges, $80 million at the community colleges. And the largest component of that $134 million were for new full-time faculty. $73 million went for new full-time faculty, 51 at the senior colleges and 22 at the community colleges. And that equated to 996 new faculty lines being added to the colleges since that time, since the summer of 2011. 588 at the senior colleges and 408 at the community colleges. So our campuses did a terrific job in making sure that these funds were, were invested well. Part of that 2011 agreement, a, a very important component of that 2011 agreement, um, was the maintenance of effort policy. So as part of the tuition increases, uh, the state legislature pushed for a maintenance of effort policy to make sure that the state provided the same level of funding in any one year for our senior colleges as they did in the prior year. Um, and so that the tuition increases would be protected from potential state budget reductions. Um, however, one of the issues um, that has occurred, especially over the last several years, is that the current the MOE legislation that was passed in 2011, which, by the way, also expires on July 1st, 2016, but the current MOE legislation did not require that mandatory cost increases be included. It just required that the same amount of funding was provided in any one year as was done in the previous year. Um, and so for this year, for example, as I know we, we talked about at our last meeting, none of our mandatory cost increases were funded on the state side. Um, and so we had a shortfall of $51 million, mostly emanating from fringe benefit costs. Um, there, ha there is revised legislation that has passed both the state assembly and the state senate that strengthens the maintenance of effort language and calls for the state to fund all mandatory cost increases, including fringe, including collective bargaining, energy, building rentals. Um, and so it's been passed by both the Senate and Assembly, um, has not been um, sent to the governor's uh, desk yet for signature. But that's an, a, a key component of the upcoming um, budget and legislative session. So in going back to tuition, um, the next slide is a comparison of where we are in terms of senior college tuition. And this data comes from IPEDS, um, which is a clearinghouse of public uh, university data. And this takes fiscal year 2014 average tuition for full-time undergraduate students. And you can see there um, on the screen, or probably uh, see it better on the hard copy document in front of you, uh, but we're very much on the low end here. Um, we're, we're a couple of notches lower than SUNY. Um, you get to folks on the high end, uh, Penn State, um, State of New Jersey, more on the high end. But again, we are still, even with the, with the $1,500 increases that have taken place over the last five years, we are still on the low end of the curve, of, uh, a curve I should say, of public higher ed institutions. Um, and I, another thing I want to point out about the slide is that this is just a comparison of tuition. This does not include fees. And had we included fees in this, we would have been much more on the low end of the curve, because our fee structure is much lower than most other public higher ed <laughs> institutions. 
Similarly, for the community colleges, on the next slide, um, you can see the comparison. And the community colleges are in a very different um, situation than the senior colleges when it comes to tuition. While in the senior colleges, um, we're very much on the low end of the scale, on the senior colleges, you can see that we're more on the high end of the scale. Um, we have a, our tuition for the current year for the community colleges for a resident um, full-time student is $4,800. Um, again, we're not, we're not uh, the highest that's out there, but we are more on the high end of the scale for the community colleges. And we're going to talk about community college tuition in just a moment. So tuition policy going forward and what's included in our request for next year for fiscal 17. Um, we support renewal of the tuition legislation for the senior colleges. So we, re re we support renewal of the predictable tuition policy um, at the state level for the senior colleges. And our budget request does include the revenue for a $300 increase at the senior colleges for next fall. Um, and as you can see there on, on the next bullet, uh, predictable tuition policy helps not only ensure the sustainability of high quality academic experience for our student and student support services, but I think one of the most important things about it is that it provides predictability for our students and families when they're planning for their academic career here at CUNY. They know coming in as a freshman what the tuition will be over the next five years, what those increases will be, and it avoids um, the situation that occurred throughout CUNY and SUNY's history, going back to when tuition was first implemented at SUNY back in the mid, uh, I'm sorry, CUNY back in the mid 70s which was there were several years that would go with no tuition increase. And you know the students that were here during that time, it was very fortunate for them. But then when there were shortfalls at the state level and um, for the senior colleges, there were very large tuition increases of 25%. 1996, there were tuition increases of over 30% um, in one fell swoop. And so by having a predictable tuition policy, we'll avoid that situation, and students and their families can plan better for their uh, academic careers. We talked just a minute ago about the community colleges and we looked at the community college uh, tuition comparison and our budget request does not plan any increase in community college tuition for next fiscal year. We are planning to keep community college tuition flat at $4,800 for next year. Um, we think that will um, help those community college students um, in terms of managing their finances and, and persisting towards degree. Um, and um, we think our community colleges, again, are very well positioned with the increases in state aid that has taken place over the last four years, the significant investment that's taken place at the city level, and the investment that they've made with using their tuition dollars over the last five years. So no planned increase in community college tuition for next fiscal year. Okay, one of the most important um, components when we talk about tuition policy at the state level is, of course, the tuition assistance program. And that 2011 law that we've been talking about a lot uh, this evening, that regarding tuition policy and regarding the main semester effort policy, also included language that the state tuition assistance program, um, that any difference in the maximum TAP award and CUNY and SUNY's tuition levels would have to be covered by the university systems. And so um, we pierced that um, maximum TAP award in the first year. This year, the maximum TAP award is $5,165. And our tuition at the senior colleges is $6,330. And so we have to cover the difference in, in, those, in those amounts. For this fiscal year, that totals $49 million that we have, that's the first call of our additional tuition revenue. $49 million have to come off the top to cover those, uh, what we call the, the TAP gap, the, the credit, uh, the TAP uh, credit. Um, and so part of our request is um, asking the state to begin to close that gap between the maximum TAP award and our tuition rates. And so we're asking the state for, that over the next five years, to provide additional funding in each year so that over the next five years, that $49 million gap will be closed. And so um, we're asking the state for um, about $10 million in our budget request 
so that we can close that gap and we can use those funds to give to our campuses to invest in new initiatives. And again, you know, financial aid, as we know, is such a key component whenever we talk about uh, tuition policy. Again, we talked about the maximum cap award is 5,165. The maximum Pell Award is 5,775. Um, this past uh, year, academic year, CUNY administered over $550 million in Pell grants, over 139,000 uh, recipients on Pell, $290 million for TAP awards um, that covered about 102,000 students. And I know that um, all of you are familiar with the data that we've been talking about for a long time, that two-thirds of our students attend tuition-free because of TAP and Pell and other financial assistance. 80% of our students here at CUNY graduate debt-free, um, which is by far uh, the best rate when you compare not only to public institutions, but of course to private institutions. And so um, we know that um, keeping financial aid opportunities um, at a high level for our students is, is very important when contemplating tuition policy. Okay, so the next slide gets into the numbers that are in our request. Um, our adopted budget for this year is $3.2 billion, and you see the three main, major funding sources there of our operating budget, state aid, city support, and tuition. Um, we are projecting that mandatory costs are going to increase by $50.4 million for next fiscal year. And we are requesting funding, increased funding for $116.6 million for programmatic initiatives um, at our colleges next year. That would bring our total request up to three point, that would bring our total budget, I should say, up to $3.4 billion for fiscal year 2017. Um, want to note that none of these figures include um, any amounts related to any labor contracts. Um, that we are, um, that we need to negotiate with our labor unions. Um, none of those uh, projected costs are in these numbers. Um, and the other thing to point out is when you look at that row for city support that um, is 321 million for this year and is going to, to grow to, um, our request has it grow to 370 million for next year. That does not include $32.3 million that the city has already committed to in the last two city adopted budgets, um, we uh, have $32 million that's already banked for the expansion of the ASAP <coughs> initiative and for the STEM uh, support initiative as part of the $93 million that, um, that the mayor has, has committed to the university. And so um, everything, even, everything left even, our city funded budget is going to go up by $32.3 million in fiscal year 17. This pie chart, I think, is, is pretty illustrative in terms of, again, talking about the shares of funding for our budget next year for both the senior colleges and the community colleges. So the top part of the page is the senior colleges and the bottom part of the community colleges. And so. This year, fiscal year 2016, um, for our senior colleges, state aid makes up 52 percent, tuition uh, comprises 47 percent, and 1 percent comes from the city. And um, our request levels would bring state aid up to 53 percent and bring tuition down to 46 percent. Um, and you see an even greater change at the community colleges because we are proposing to keep community college tuition flat for next year. Um, the, amount of our budget for community colleges that would come from tuition would decrease by three percentage points next year based on our budget request. This year, um, tuition makes up 42% of the community college budget. Um, it's the largest component of the community college budget. 32% comes from the city and 26% comes from the state. But our request calls for tuition to go down to 39%, city to go to 34, and state to go to 27. So that's a good direction to move in. Um, slide 12 shows a, the summary of what the $116 million in programmatic initiatives will be invested in. And I won't go through each um, item, but certainly happy to, to take questions on, on any of these items, um, because each of those is described in detail in the budget request narrative that, that you have. Um, but just talk about a couple of, of um, 
of the major items, um, some of the more critical items. Um, we talked earlier um, about our medical school. And as I mentioned earlier when we were reviewing the medical school resolution, that we are requesting from the state funding um, for $2.8 million to help fund the expenses at our medical school. Um, this request is based on the same amount of um, per student aid that the state provides to SUNY for, for its medical schools. You can also see that we're requesting funding for the performance improvement plan. Um, this year, the state included $12 million in performance improvement funding for our, for our senior colleges, um, which we're really grateful to receive. Um, and we're requesting the state not only reappropriates that $12 million for next year, but enhances that funding and doubles it to $24 million. And we're also hoping to use some of the state aid for the community colleges to, to fund a performance improvement plan for the community colleges as well for $12 million. Um, experiential learning was also another um, component of the, of the state budget this past year. The state budget included language um, for SUNY and CUNY to develop plans to, um, to provide each student with an experiential learning experience as part of their um, degree completion. Uh, we have a committee right now that's led by President Jeremy Travis at John Jay College that is looking at this issue. And so we need the committee to complete their work to come up with an estimate in terms of how much it would cost to, um, to implement experiential learning for all of our students. We do have a lot of experiential learning um, components right now um, at our campuses, but um, we wanted to put it in here as a TBD, as a placeholder. Um, and then when the committee is done with their analysis, we'll have a better sense of what the need is. Um, some of the other items we've talked a lot about um, over the years, online learning, math remediation, um, workforce development. Um, but again, won't go through all of them. They're all part of, of your narrative section. Our mandatory needs, um, you can see there's um, five major components there. Um, we talked earlier about that the mandatory needs, um, we're projecting that they're going to increase by $50.4 million for next year. The largest component of that, again, is fringe benefits, $29.5 million. Um, you'll notice on that chart that there's a zero for community colleges for fringe benefits next year, and that's because the city has already put the, uh, has funded the increase for community college fringe benefits for next year than they did last year's budget. So our community college fringe benefit estimate is already funded for fiscal 17 on the city side. Um, the other components are energy, building rentals, contractual salary payments, <coughs> um, and then again, we have a TBD for collective bargaining. So, next slide talks about how we're going to pay for all this. $50.4 million in mandatory needs, $116 million in programmatic initiatives, and this breaks down the sources of funding to finance the request. So, we're asking the state and the city to fund our mandatory needs, $44 million from the state, $6.4 million from the city. We're asking for the state to fund strategic initiatives of $31.3 million, and the city to fund strategic initiatives of $10 million. Um, we're asking the state, as mentioned earlier, to begin to restore some of that tap credit, $10 million for next year. And we're asking the state for a $250 increase in the per FTE funding for community colleges. Um, community colleges are funded um, at the state, at both SUNY and CUNY community colleges uh, on a formula basis, a per FTE formula. Um, and we're asking for a $250 increase for next year and in each of the subsequent two fiscal years. So we're asking for a three year commitment on the state side that would generate $26.3 million for our community colleges next year. Last component, as we talked about earlier, the tuition revenue for the senior colleges. This assumes a $300 increase at the senior colleges for next fall, which would generate $51 million. We would have to net off um, $12 million to cover the tap gap, which would leave $39 million available for investment um, in our senior colleges. So in terms of next steps, um, we're bringing the request to the fiscal committee tonight. 
present it to the full board um, later in the month, November 23rd, at uh, the meeting of the full board of trustees. Um, once approved by the board, um, it will then be shared with elected officials. Um, and the timing is key because the governor is going to be issuing his executive budget for fiscal 17 in mid-January. The mayor will be issuing his preliminary budget um, likely later that month. And so it's important for us to get our budget request out um, and make sure that the folks up in Albany and, and down City Hall have our request document for, for next year. Um, we're happy to take any questions on the request. And I just before I do so, I want to acknowledge our university budget director, Kathy Abada, who's at the table with us. And um, just thank Kathy and everyone in the university budget office for um, the great work that they did in putting together next year's budget request. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Sapienza. Before we have questions or comments, and we will have many, I'm sure, no. um, <clears throat> the resolution is at your table. I did not read it into the record because I didn't think it would be sensible without the explanation that we now had. Uh, so we have that resolution. This is what we have moved and seconded, and this is what we will be voting on. So questions and comments from the committee? Professor Martel. I, I have four. Uh, on, on page 11, when we do the funding sources, and we've, we've talked about this before, yes. it's absolutely accurate, but I really wish we would prepare a set of pie charts that, that shows the uh, impact of TAP in, in this calculation. Because while it is, of course, tuition is all equally state aid so that you know we tend to underestimate and therefore underappreciate the amount of money we de facto get from the state tap money flows right from the state to the account the student doesn't see it, it it's a credit against their tuition bill to, it it should in my in my view be counted directly in that pie chart or at least at least another set of pie charts so that the right number uh, gets out there and we're talking uh, apples to apples. Mm -hmm. On page three, perhaps we can do that for the board meeting. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I support that. Um, I think when you have an alternative pie chart, you might also want to put federal aid because we get federal aid, significant federal aid from Pell, mm -hmm. but we also get some federal aid from uh, research grants. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what other sources federal aid comes from, but it's uh, when you lump together Pell and our research grants, it's a pretty significant uh, percent of the budget that comes from the federal government. And we, and we ought to be, as a committee, we ought to have a sense of that. Right. Uh, what what we get from Pell and from research and any other, I don't know if we have any DARPA money or, or any other federal money, but it's uh, it, it's a sizable chunk of our budget. So on page three, we talk about 996 new factory lines. Is that a gross number or a net number? That's a, a net, that's a, um, that is the number of new faculty lines that were added. Right. Um, it is not a net number in terms of there were some faculty that retired right. um, and that there were you know, uh, replacements for that. That's the number of new lines that were added at the colleges. I understand. But it would be, <coughs> it would be useful to see the net number as well because that's the yeah. actual bodies in front of the students. Right, understood. And, and one of the, the uh, it's a great point, and one of the things to just keep in mind is also um, during, this, during um, this time period, there was an early retirement incentive that right. took place at the state level. Um, and um, as, as a result of the early retirement, we lost about 375 um, right. full-time faculty that took the early retirement. Now, we more than made up for it with new faculty lines, but, but you're right, and we can, we can certainly provide the... Uh, total numbers. And enrollment increased too, but that's correct. My and actually, that, that's a great point, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but... Um, everyone, know, everyone does. Feel free. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Vice Chancellor Hurston was pointing this out earlier at our executive uh, committee meeting, um, that um, when, in, in 2011, when the legislation was passed, our, um, our enrollment university-wide was 262,000. 
and now it's 275,000. So um, despite the tuition increases, um, our enrollment increased by 6% um, over, that, over that five year time period. My third question is on page two, and it's really, uh, I look at the uh, city of New York uh, projections, and I just ask your advice, is no, is no tuition increase at community colleges uh, mm -hmm. a prudent move if we're looking at these kind of negative numbers? Yeah, I think, um, you know, on the city side, um, we've already, as I said earlier, have locked in $32 million in increases for it next fiscal year. Um, the total amount going out to fiscal 19 of new city funding that we're going to receive is $93 million. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really an historic investment in, the, in our community colleges from the city over that time. Um, we've been fortunate as well that um, we've had four consecutive years of state aid increases at the community colleges. Um, our base aid per FTE formula at the community colleges is still below 2009 levels, mm -hmm. so we, we're still asking the state to continue to make investments in the community college base aid. Um, but we have had four years of increases. Um, and again, the, the, the tuition increases at the community colleges at $300 a year for five years have had um, greater purchasing power at the community colleges because their tuition is lower. And so um, the community colleges um, are in a different fiscal position than the senior colleges. Um, and again, going back to what I said earlier, we know that um, um, on the whole, that um, community college students have um, more of a fiscal challenge personally when it comes to tuition rates than, than senior colleges do on the whole. Um, we certainly know that the senior college students that, that have those challenges. Um, but for all those factors, we think that the right thing to do is to um, is to recommend no increase to community college tuition for next year. Thank you. My last question has to do with the uh, resolution itself. Uh, there's no explicit uh, mention of the tuition increase at the senior colleges. Mm -hmm. And historically, there's been a mention if there was going to be a tuition increase. Is there a new right. explain that? No, it's a, it's a very good question. We're not asking the board at this point time to um, vote and approve a tuition increase. Um, we're asking the board to vote and approve the budget request, which um, calls for the predictable tuition legislation to be um, extended. Um, but because the state has not taken action to formally extend that legislation, we're not asking the board to, to vote on a tuition increase at this point. Um, but we are asking to vote on a budget that supports the extension of the predictable tuition policy. So in essence, we don't have the authority to well, say We actually yes. have the authority, but we're not prepared to. I think without new legislation right. for this yeah. budget right. year, we don't we yet have We not have the authority, authority because it expires in June. We could vote the increase. We just couldn't spend the increase. Correct. Right. Right. That's right. correct. I mean, we that's do not correct. recommend yeah. that. <laughs> right. I, well, you know, I mean. Right. That that's would be wrong. Thing. <laughs> it's hard to explain. Yeah. <laughs> Trustee Clark. Yeah, I wanted to figure out whether we can have some expression of support as trustees for the labor contract. I think the bottom line is that um, all of the employees from professors, you don't want people disgruntled. And if we sit back and we don't say something affirmatively that we support whatever the numbers are going to be, and we know it's going to be negotiated in labor, and it may be in the first two years you get this, the next two years you get that. But we may not know what the number is, but I think an expression of our support for the staff not having a contract is important. And for me, it is. In, in many ways. You know, we may not put a number, but at least if we give an expression, it gives them, it gives the staff a sense that we are concerned about their working without a contract. Is there a way to do that? Well, I, I believe, I think there is a way, and I believe Chairperson Schmidt has already done that on behalf of the board. The we had an executive committee meeting this afternoon at 3 o'clock, and we had an executive session uh, of that committee, and we heard a report from the chancellor about uh, 
collective bargaining. Um, and I think I can say, and about plans to put forward some proposals on collective bargaining from the university quite soon. The fact that I'm new, please and excuse me if I'm stepping out of bounds. No, but you're not. I, and, and I need operating, you know. And, and the executive committee uh, expressed, we weren't asked to take action, but we were, our consensus was that we expressed our approval of, uh, of moving the collective bargaining process forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But I, I think, Chairperson Schmidt, unless I'm remembering incorrectly, you have written on behalf of the board, the board's support for a collective bargaining I have. Yeah. I have on behalf of Of course, of the, the chancellor has spoken for the last year of the need to get a collective bargaining agreement behind us. Okay. Other questions or comments? Joseph. All right. <clears throat> if I do stay silent on this issue when it comes to tuition, then I'm not doing what the students elected me for. So first, I would like to say Average. to Chancellor Millican, thank you so very much for not continuing to raise tuition at community college levels because you know the hardship the students are facing. Yes, so we do not know what the university exactly, the amount they are planning on raising for the senior colleges. And if I do tell you that I will support that, it will be, the answer will be no. But we just want to know exactly what the university is thinking of in terms of how much the senior colleges will be asked to pay each student. Also, to visit Sapiens, I would like to say thank you so very much for including us in, in the discussion. Whether well, this is going to really help us in terms of the advocacy that the university or the city is trying to push and how we can help, we are all willing to help. And lastly, I would like to ask, in terms of the MOE bill that's on the table, if the government does not sign, how does that impact this budget? Um, well, in terms of impacting um, the, the current year budget, well, it won't impact the current year budget. Um, if, the, if the legislation is signed, um, then the state would, have, would be legally required to uh, cover our mandatory cost increases going forward. Um, so things like collective bargaining and fringe benefits and energy would be, would be included. Um, our budget request um, calls for the state to, to fully fund those things um, um, without the MOE legislation, but certainly um, we support the MOE legislation um, and we're grateful for the Senate and the Assembly for passing it. Um, and the, the, uh, the legislation, um, had, we have until December 31st to see if it's going to be signed by the governor. Yes? So I have a number of questions for you. Um, first, when you're talking about a $300 increase for senior colleges, mm -hmm. are you expecting to essentially replicate the rational tuition model of, can we expect that to be what you're going to propose for the following years? Um, number two, will, what will these increases specifically go towards and what steps are in place to guarantee that the money is used to directly benefit students and improve education? Um, rather than just serve as a stopgap measure. Um, three, what has CUNY administration done in order to advocate for the state to renew more MOE legislation? Um, and how has the university or the students directly benefited from the prior increases other than the thousand or so um, faculty lines that were created? Okay. Thank you. Um, so let me talk about, um, let me answer the question about how students have benefited. And I'm going to go um, to this slide on, on the predictable tuition policy. Um, of the <coughs> tuition that was, of the revenue that we received over the five years of tuition increases, um, we have um, been able to invest $214 million of, of that amount directly into new things at our campuses. Um, and again, we hired almost 1,000 new faculty lines, which um, back in 2011, that was our top priority. And so I'm uh, very grateful to our campuses um, for, for implementing that plan and, and bringing 1,000 new faculty lines um, to our students. Um, so um, our plans for going forward, um, you can see what our plans are in terms of, of next year. Um, 
Again, we have a, a big amount there for investment in faculty, $30 million um, from the $39 million that would be generated from the senior colleges. Again, we want to invest in faculty. And you can see some of the other items that, we, that we'd like to um, enhance um, at our campuses, online education, um, you know, student support, um, in terms of scholarships, workforce development, all of those items that, that will help uh, the student experience at our campuses. Um, in terms of what steps are in place to ensure that these funds are um, invested in, in those priorities, um, we do have a financial plan process with our campuses. Um, and whenever there is um, new programmatic initiatives at our campuses from tuition money, we ask that, um, I shouldn't say we ask, we require that our college presidents um, develop those plans in consultation with elected student and faculty leaders. Um, and so that, that has been in place since we um, started in the tuition increases back in, in the fall of 2011. Um, in terms of advocating um, at the state level, we certainly have been, have been doing that um, over, over many years. And I go back to um, what uh, Trustee Awajide said earlier, and we, we certainly um, appreciate the partnership that we have with the University Student Senate. Um, and as, as I tell the students every time you know, we, we talk about this issue, there are no better advocates that we have um, for anything that we talk to folks, elected officials about, whether at the state level or state level, than our students. Um, those are the best advocates we can, we can have. And so we certainly look forward to uh, continuing and strengthening the partnership with the USS to help us advocate for those, those things that are important. Just, I would add one more point to that, just a footnote. The single most important investment that this university can make in its student success is in hiring the best faculty and retaining them. So the investment in faculty, they've made a 1,000 new faculty, investing in our current faculty so that we can retain them and let them continue to do the work that they do. This is a, has to be at the highest uh, place on the university's priorities, and it has the most significant impact on the quality of students' education. And in terms of your last question, sorry, um, regarding the, the out years, um, we are um, recommending that the predictable tuition policy be extended for up to $300 a year for the next five years. Um, and the rate of each of those five years will depend on what our fiscal condition is once we get there. Um, so this request assumes $300 for the senior colleges, um, but we're not taking a position about what the actual tuition will be in those five years, just that we would have the ability to raise tuition up to $300 a year in each of those years. <coughs> should, the, should the board approve it, of course. <laughs> Beal. So I, I just wanted to, to respond to Cecilia. I can say that, I don't know if um, Chancellor Milken had planned on this, um, but I can say he has spent 99%, 90 percent of his time advocating on behalf of the university. I, I think he would have preferred to have been involved in a lot of educational development and, and uh, other things, but um, he has been up in Albany and everywhere that you can see advocating and when you want to know what we've done, I think that he is to be commended that he has walked into this and from day one, the majority of his I may be overstating, but it seems to me the majority of his time has been out there advocating on behalf of, of the university. So uh, I can tell you that it's been nonstop for at least 18 months uh, uh, of him and the entire staff doing that. Joseph. Yeah, in regards to TAP, if we are sending a recommendation, why is it that we do not have any language in there requesting a reform for TAP, especially for us, the graduate students? We don't have any help, and therefore, this would definitely help if we can push for tap reform to support the graduate student. Because if increase is going to go up, we will suffer a lot. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'd like to know what are we doing. We don't have any language in there to reform tap. Yeah, I think uh, you raise an excellent point. Uh, tap reform, I think, is, is critical as part of this whole um, legislation that we've been talking about, tuition policy, maintenance of effort, um, and, and tap reform is certainly included in there. Um, back in 2013, the state required um, SUNY and CUNY to, um, to submit recommendations on, on improving the TAP uh, program. 
um, which we did, and that report's on our website um, if anyone's interested in seeing it. Um, graduate TAP, as you, as you mentioned, Joseph, um, we know has been uh, something that um, the students have been calling for for a while. And again, we're certainly, um, we more than welcome working together with USS on um, coming up with recommendations on how to, how to improve TAP. I think, I think uh, uh, calling for TAP reform ought to be an important part of what we uh, stand for in Albany because there are some changes that I think are, uh, are, are justified Agreed. and needed. Agreed. Yeah. So I, I completely agree. And this is something we've been working with our colleagues at SUNY on as well. Right. On a TAP reform right. next year. When will you be in a position to update the committee and the board about those efforts? Uh, I think probably in, in um, a few months. As the chancellor said, we are we have been talking to SUNY about it. Um, you know, it might not be an item that's um, probably not likely an item to be addressed in the in the executive budget process, but certainly uh, post budget and as part of the, the legislative session that will take place in Albany. Um, we're hoping to work with SUNY to um, to get some attention on that on that issue. Other questions or comments? Oh. I would just like to say um, I am very concerned about the language um, that is used, especially like if we look at the document on page two, mm -hmm. where it says, you know, the university is not planning a tuition increase for the community colleges, mm -hmm. um, but we know that resolutions can be passed later on, and that is a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I am very concerned that there was no explicit language saying we are going to push for um, graduate tuition increases or anything like that. So mm -hmm. I would like clearer language like next time. But like, this budget, this, I know this budget a, doesn't contemplate that. And if I this know. budget is approved by the board, there wouldn't be any community college increase mm -hmm. contained within the budget. But the possibility still exists. And that's it would always exist. Yeah. 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 I mean, that would have to come back to this committee and then to the board. Right. It's not our intention to um, to increase community college tuition for next year, um, but you know, if things uh, you know, if there's a, a major uh, you know financial collapse, um, or, if, or if we're um, hit with um, you know major budget reductions, which we're not expecting, but you know, you never know what can happen, and so we need to. Um, you know, leave ourselves that flexibility if those things were to occur. But it's certainly not our intention um, to increase community college tuition for next year. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I, I just had two. Uh, with regard to the experiential learning, which is to be determined, and I understand that that's an ongoing process, mm -hmm. do you have some rough order of magnitude of what that number might be too early? Yeah, I think it's too early. Um, you know, again, we're, we're a system of, you know, 275,000 students. And as I said earlier, while we do have um, some terrific programs in place um, that, that um, include experiential learning, and while there are a lot of things that are part of a student's um, academic uh, profile and, and in terms of the classes that they have to take that include experiential learning components, um, it is a big system. And if we want to ensure that every student has that um, uh, component, I think you know it certainly is not going to be a, you know a small number, but um, but I think it's too early to say. When we finally do get the number, I'd be interested in the metric we're going to use to measure success or not, mm -hmm. whatever the program is. Mm -hmm. And likewise in workforce development, yes. uh, that's eight million dollars, three and five. Yep. What's the metric we use to measure the success of? The, the spending of those dollars and those programs. Yeah, I think I think one of the the main metrics that we will use um, if if this we're successful in getting funding here is um, is we are calling for and again this will help us with experiential learning. Um, we're calling for our campuses to um, use these dollars to um, to help um, achieve partnerships with the private sector. Um, for student internships uh, in the private sector, but 
But part of this also is to um, work with the industry to find out what skills they're looking for um, in terms of their workforce. Um, so that, again, our campuses can work with industry to, to design the curriculum um, and develop programs that will help feed right into, into, the, into the industry needs. Um, so that's part of it as well, is developing partnerships um, with, with the workforce and, and designing new curriculum um, for, for changing industry needs. Um, and so we have a, you know, a few things on there. We have experiential learning. We have workforce development that's on there. And the other thing I want to point out is the CUNY Service Corps. Um, we currently have 800 students in the CUNY Service Corps. Um, and we are, part of this request is that we want to grow that by 600 students. Um, that's been a really successful program that's giving our students um, real work <coughs> experience um, throughout the five boroughs. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Uh, hearing none, uh, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. One opposition, any abstentions? Resolution carries. <coughs> I don't believe there's any further business before the committee. And hearing none, I move to adjourn. Hear, hear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. She would be involved with next year. So <coughs> I her to attend the audit committee, and she met uh, with Peter uh, before this meeting today. And lastly, we have Benny returning. He is the partner from Watson Rice. We do utilize Watson Rice uh, staff on our engagement, and he helps uh, with coordinating those efforts. Okay, so there's two deliverables in front of you. One is the presentation, and one is the draft of the financial statements. Jason and I will go through the presentation, uh, which includes the results of the audit. Um, please feel free to interrupt with any questions. But included on slide two, we do have the engagement team. We have quite a few members um, on this team. Uh, the first half are the core members, those who are on site day to day at the colleges and the central office. And then our other team members include our various specialists that we use to assist the core team with various areas. I've seen, I've read it. The next two slides, I'm not going to spend um, any time on these. You have seen these before. Uh, there are responsibilities of this committee and responsibilities of management uh, during the audit process. There are also responsibilities for KPMG, and those are included on slide five, and I am going to touch upon a few of these. Um, the first bullet talks about our responsibility to express an audit opinion on CUNY's financial statements. We do plan to issue an unmodified or a clean audit opinion on the 2015 financial statements. I do want to also bring to your attention two other items that are included in our opinion. There are 80 discreetly presented component units. These, uh, the financial information for these component units are carved out on the statement of net position and the statement of changes. We do not audit 27 out of 80 of those component units. We do rely, most of those are the foundations. We do rely on the opinions of the other auditors. We do obtain all of the final audited financial statements. I do review those. And we also confirm independence uh, and the qualifications of those auditors as part of our audit. And the other item I wanted to bring to your attention is a new paragraph that was included in the audit opinion this year. It does make reference to the university's adoption of GASB 68, which did require a restatement of your opening unrestricted net position of $887.9 million. We will be spending some time during the presentation talking about... Peter. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Finish your thought. Okay. <laughs> um, on our audit procedures and what that really represents. The last item on this slide I wanted to bring to your attention are the um, uh, professional standards that we do follow. We do conduct the audit in accordance with auditing standards that are generally accepted in the United States, as well as the applicable standards within the government auditing standards. Um, and that is because we will issue um, an opinion on the university's major programs. And when we issue that, the financial statements of the, of the university are included in that report. Would like to ask you a question? When you say you audit 27 out of the 80, right? Or you, we don't, you audit don't audit 27 out of the 80. It sounds like a relatively small number, but then when you look at the proportion, yes. 
the proportions are huge, 90, 92%, et cetera. Because the foundations hold the vast majority of the uh, discreetly presented foundations investments, that's why the percentages are so high. It's still 60% of revenues, though, which kind of surprises me. The large amount of contributions. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, on the next slide, just a status. Um, we did complete our procedures. Interim procedures were uh, performed from May through August. Most of that was actually on site at the various colleges performing the financial statement test work as well as the audits of the federal awards, principally student financial assistance. And then our year end procedures from September through November um, that was done at the university central office. Uh, the pending matters are included here. Uh, most of these really relate to our top partner reviews that still need to occur or are ongoing as we speak. And the one item for the buff confirmation response was received on Friday. I am going to turn it over to Jason, who's going to touch upon um, the next few slides. Sure. Thank you, Shelley. Good evening, everyone. Um, on slides 8 through 10, just a, a highlight of the, the primary audit focus areas that we uh, touch upon uh, as we conduct the annual audit of the university's financial statements. These are areas that include significant accounts or disclosures that we uh, obtain an understanding of the university's process and controls. We'll test the design operating effectiveness of such controls as we deem applicable, and then perform any other remaining substantive audit procedures to appropriately reduce what we, what we consider to be the risk of material misstatement to the overall financial statement presentation to a, to a ac acceptable low level so that we can form our conclusions and render our opinions. Um, just some highlights on, the, on these slides are um, some areas where we actually do involve specialists to help uh, perform reviews of some of the assumptions used by the university uh, to record amounts in their financial statements. So for the OPEB liabilities and expense, uh, we have a KPMG actuary who reviews those assumptions that are, that are provided by, by Buck and the city actuary, as well as with the, um, the uh, accounting for derivative instruments, the valuation of interest rate swap agreements. We, we involve specialists who have uh, significant financial resource management experience to determine whether those liabilities are properly stated <coughs> in the, the notional and stated values of the swap agreements that the university holds. The one area that I did want to touch upon a little bit more deeply uh, is on slide nine. It's the last box on, on that slide, which is the, the valuation and presentation of net pension liabilities. As Shelley had mentioned, the university did adopt GASB statement number 68 uh, this year, um, which was the accounting and financial reporting of pensions by employers who participate in uh, cost sharing multiple, multiple employer pension plans, as well as if you have a single employer pension plan, um, that's a defined benefit plan. Uh, these liabilities and other calculations uh, of expense and what we call deferred outflows and inflows of resources, which is an accounting term for some timing differences between when uh, costs are incurred or when um, you know, the expenses are paid out uh, over a, a set amount of years, those amounts can be deferred on the, on the university's statement of net position or the balance sheet until such time when they're amortized into the uh, applicable pension expense going forward. So, as Shelley had mentioned, upon the adoption of GASB Statement 68, the university had to go back to restate their opening net position for what the, their proportionate share of the university's liabilities were in the New York City Employees Retirement System, the ERS plan, as well as the, the Teachers Retirement System of New York City, the TRS plan. So the combination of those amounts uh, resulted in um, an 800 and, sorry. $887 million opening balance adjustment, as well as amounts to record in this year's financial statements as of June 30th, 15, in a, in a total amount of $755 million, which is what's re represented as the, the net pension liability on the statement of net position. Practically speaking, unless the city defaulted, that's not a liability we'd have to actually face. It's, it's an actuarially determined liability, so it's not an actual cash in, cash out liability, but it's yeah, it is more of an accounting and entry liability. It's funded by actual New York State. But if the funding did not materialize, I suspect the deep the deep pockets in that fund would would have some significant exposure. So the premise that I'm working from is. 
755 is a real number, the probability of it actually ever hitting our books is one basis point. Well, I mean, the pension expense is running through your statement mm. of changes. Right. So it is an impacting the university through those means. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, those liabilities are actuarially determined, and we do involve a KPMG specialist to review those. As well as this year, since this is the first year of adopting GASB 68, we have on our team a, a GASB 68 impl implementation reviewer to help ensure that we are conducting the audit procedures in accordance with the new AICPA guidance that came out uh, this past year over governmental pensions, as well as uh, determining that the amounts and up financial statements are accurately recorded. Any questions on the, those three slides? No? I'm just busily trying to imagine the life of that Gatsby 68 reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, on slide 11, uh, our responsibility is to communicate to you any corrected or uncorrected misstatements in the financial things as part of the conduct of our audit. Um, we did note that there was one corrected audit adjustment noted during um, the implementation of Gatsby 68 in which pension expense originally reported by the university was reduced by $13.1 million as that amount of pension expense that was initially recorded uh, related uh, more towards the deferral of those amounts in future periods and were um, reclassified from pension expense in the and flowing through the statement of changes to uh, a deferred outflow of resources on the statement of net position. There were also two uncorrected audit adjustments identified during the audit to date, first relating to approximately $45.7 million of capital appropriations related to principal and interest payments that were really related to FY 2014 uh, um, activity, but was recorded in fiscal year 2015 as, as just due to timing differences. The second related to a $1.7 million uh, amount of unrestricted contributions that was received in fiscal year 2014 by one of the university's foundations, but they were uh, recorded in temporarily restricted net assets in error. On slide 12, um, really just the new accounting policies and practices, and, and, and I'm not going to go over, we already discussed GASME Statement 68. Um, in terms of any non-GAAP policies that the university has or continues to utilize in the preparation uh, in their financial statements for efficiency purposes, we continue to monitor those and, and, and note that they are still proper and uh, there's no material ex uh, differences or exceptions with those policies. On slide 13, our reports and other deliverables, uh, we, are, we, we do provide our report on the university's financial statements. We will also, uh, after the issuance of those financial statements, will uh, report upon the senior college audit report, which is the carve out of the senior college information specifically to them. Uh, and issued in a separate report. report. We issue a separate opinion on, on those senior colleges. And also the, the federal OMB A133 audit report um, related to the single audit and the, and the expenditures related uh, primarily to the university student financial assistance cluster that we provide our report on internal control and compliance. And as Shelley mentioned earlier, why we issue our um, report on internal control and compliance in, in, um, in accordance with government auditing standards too on the financial statements is in relation to these um, these federal uh, single audit reports. And uh, we will also issue our management letter to report on any um, uh, internal control observations or other matters to note um, that the university uh, will provide responses to uh, later in the February meeting. On slide 14, other matters that we are required to communicate to you. Uh, in terms of going concern, there's no events or conditions identified that would cast substantial doubt on the university's ability to continue as a going concern. Litigation claims and assessments, there were no significant pending litigation that required disclosure in the financial statements. In terms of illegal acts of fraud, non-compliance with laws and regulations, or any significant changes to the planned audit scope, there were none noted. And in terms of any significant difficulties encountered uh, during the audit or disagreements with management or their consultation with other accounts, there were no matters to report. On slide 15, uh, the external auditor is required to assess certain fraud risks that are uh, embedded within the financial statements. Uh, the two pervasive risks that the standards uh, require us to perform certain procedures on are any risk of misstatement due to revenue recognition. So these are primarily focused around the completeness, existence, and accuracy uh, of, uh, and, and recognition of tuition and fees revenue. 
and we perform control and substantive procedures over this uh, account, significant account balance and perform also cutoff uh, test work procedures to ensure that the proper timing and recognition of tuition and fees revenue is, is reported in the proper period. And uh, we did not note any uh, matters uh, to report to you or any exceptions on, the, on that account. Also, the risk of management override of controls. This is a pervasive impact on all significant accounts, and it, re and it, it involves areas such as uh, significant accounting estimates or any uh, significant unusual transactions or journal entries that are posted uh, outside of the normal policies and procedures that the university has in place. And again, we did not note any, any matters related to that. And, and just one other thing is that if there were any specific fraud risks that we identified during the course of our audit related to uh, certain account balances or disclosures, we would have to perform those procedures as well, and we did not note any uh, for the university as well. On slide 16, material wit uh, written communication between KPMG and management. Uh, the four items to report to you uh, are the engagement letter, the in-house legal counsel letter, which we received uh, back in July, and we will get an update from, from Fred in the, uh, in the, um, uh, as we move towards uh, issuance of this report to make sure that there are no matters uh, that he seems as an as a impact on the university's um, financial statements or disclosures. The representation letter, which is the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the items that uh, management has repped to us during the, the course of our audit so that we can uh, uh, ensure that everything that we receive is complete and accurate to uh, form our, our audit and, and form our opinion. And also the management letter, as I discussed earlier, that we will issue with any uh, observations or recommendations. In terms of independence, on slide 17, uh, we are not aware of any relationships between KPMG and the university that, in our professional judgment, uh, may reasonably be, be thought to bear upon our independence. And related to our 2015 audit services, we are independent with respect to the university within the meetings of the published rules and regulations of the Government Accountability Office, the pronouncements of the Independent Standards, Standards Board under Rule 101 of the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct, and there were also no management advisory services performed by KPMG towards the university during fiscal year 15. Quick question, any advisory services to any university entity like foundations or anything? Not that I'm aware of. And on slide 18, just... Oh, no, I'm sorry, just saying, not that we're aware of. Right. On slide 18, uh, just to uh, let's shed some light on an upcoming uh, uh, accounting pronouncement that will affect the university's financial statements for fiscal year 16 is GASB statement number 72 for fair value measurement and application which is the objective to uh, address accounting and reporting issues related to fair value measurements and related disclosures. This really is going to bring the entities who report under GASB standards in accordance with the way the FASB uh, entities have reported uh, fair value measurement using the level one, two, and three in their disclosures, as well as certain measurements for uh, accounting and, and um, for certain uh, assets and liabilities that will be recorded at fair value. And this will be um, the, the, uh, this will impact the university's fiscal year 16 financial statements, and management will need to determine any any impact on those amounts and recorded amounts and disclosures going forward. Next question. The other item that was included as an appendix was the draft management representation letter. It was one of the material written communication items that Jason spoke about a few slides before. Well, that is provided for your review. Any questions on anything that we spoke about? And I would be happy to take questions on the draft financial statements. Just one general comment about the draft financial statements is the biggest change in here from prior year relates to the adoption of GASB 68. So there were new disclosures for that, as well as some changes to the financial statement presentation. Any questions from the committee? Just not for, just on the MDNA. Okay. Now or later? Yeah. Sure. Yes. You can, now. I can give you now? Now no, rather Number six. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, on, on page 23, uh, economic factors that will affect the future, that's a discussion of the risks associated with the, in, in the MDNA section. Uh, I thought it might it could be expanded a tad to reflect some of the competitive issues with which we face. This is almost entirely targeted towards 
the city and state, which of course were important, but nevertheless, it seems to me every time we look around, we have another competitor uh, either directly in our area or have representative offices in our area. And when I look at the, the long-term debt situation on uh, the same page, and I look at the graduate st student enrollment, data a couple pages later. Mm -hmm. Earlier, I, I just think we, we could elaborate a little bit more on on the kind of risks that we've got to deal with as an organization. Mm -hmm. That's it. No, I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a terrific point. And um, going forward, we'll make sure that we include um, all of the economic factors and not just the ones that um, are directly related to state and city finance. It's interesting. We're so focused on the political side of our, of our budget operation, we, we kind of forget that we're in Every time I walk around the city, I see another school opened up from another country or another state. It's it's like this is a market where there are people with the money to you know to pay for education. We just got to be cognizant of the competitive environment. Very good point. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. In that case, we're going to move. Chair, uh, Chair I'm sorry. I, I, we I know on the agenda we had that we were going to go into executive right. session and then vote. Um, We're going to vote now, actually. Yes, thank okay. you. You're way ahead of me as usual. All right, so, um, the, we're going to jump to policy uh, item number one on the or item on the policy calendar is resolution requesting that the subcommittee on audit approves the FY 2015 audited financial statements as just presented by KPMG. I move the approval of action on item number one on the policy calendar. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Abstentions? It's passed. Uh, we're going to just impose upon uh, time before we had, uh, formally adjourn uh, to do two things. One, we thought we'd ask the CUNY financial management to step out if they don't mind. Uh, we'd like five minutes at best with uh, KPMG and then ask you to come back and we'd like a few minutes with you without sure. KPMG. And if I can, Chair Panel, I'll just take a minute. I just want to um, recognize the folks in the University Controller's Office um, who put together these financial statements under the leadership of, of Lenz and Anthony and Miriam Katowitz. And I want to recognize those people, especially um, who aren't here, who spent uh, many summer um, weekends and many late evenings away from their families and in, in working on this. It's a ton of work, and I just want to recognize those folks. And also recognize Shelly. Um, I know she, her KPMG policy is rolling off the CUNY account. Um, but we'll still see you at the February meeting, yes. right? So, uh, but I'll say thank you again in February, okay. but just want to recognize uh, Shelley's professionalism and her, her good counsel to us over these, over these many years. Yeah. Matt, did, wasn't this audit done during the flood? <laughs> yes, Terry, bring, <laughs> Terry Martel brings up a good point in that um, we unfortunately um, had a flood situation in our offices at uh, 230 West 41st Street, and we were out of our offices for three months in, uh, in alternative space. Um, and it was very disruptive, um, but the staff, um, um, just, uh, just tremendous professionalism. Um, you know, the next day after flood, people were in their new locations and, you know, working like nothing happened. So, so thank you for, for mentioning that and recognizing that. Appreciate it. And thank you for, for acknowledging the, the, uh, the team. We really do appreciate what you all have done. So if we could have uh, five minutes with KPMG, that would be great. And then please just stand by, Matt, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, we'll be okay. right. We need to officially adjourn the oh, I'm sorry. Session. Or is that me? That's you. Okay. That's right. uh, we are adjourning the uh, committee, uh, subcommittee on audit. Uh, we're going into executive session, and we will not be coming back into public session. So we have to clear the room, please. Very good. Executive session, please clear the room. Thank you very much.